Hello everyone, welcome to Nighttime, our brand new show here at HTFN here at UCF, here to talk all about UCF football and the college football landscape. Today we have a special show for you guys today since it is game day, talking about Boise State UCF. We also have a special interview with Jason Beattie at the end of the episode, so I hope you guys stay tuned. Things gonna change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you yeah, ain't never keep it real. Three rings in my hand, I'm a warrior to the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring the facts. When I make a highlight, they gon' replay run it back, okay? Always locked in, now I got time to lax. Saying he the best, he could take a lap. Batted 1,000 when you check the stats. Boy, is you ready? You ain't gotta ask. Here is the start of nighttime. In just a few hours, UCF football will begin their first game of the season versus Boise State. We're so excited to get back into the bounce house with a full stadium. Kyle, how excited are you for the game today? I'm so excited for the game today, Taylor, especially with the return of Gus Malzahn to the bounce house, not the return, but his start of the era at the bounce house, as I might say. Gus Malzahn is a huge, highly touted um, coach out of Auburn. He has won a national championship, won plenty of New Year's Six Bowl games, and I'm so excited to see what he's going to bring to UCF. Yeah, I agree. I think we're going to see so many improvements for this UCF team, especially on offense. We pretty much know that Coach Gus, he literally wrote a book on high tempo offense and how to run this team. I think we're going to see so much better use of the field this year. Our defense is not going to be tired like they were the last few seasons with these big runs with big throws and you're on and off the field super fast whether you execute a touchdown or not and the defense was running back on the field. I think Gus is going to bring a nice breath of fresh air to this team. I'm very excited and I also think that Dylan is arguably the best quarterback that he's ever had as a head coach. Yes, and you also said about the run game earlier, that's what Gus Malzahn is going to bring to the table. A power run game along with RPO and play action to set up deep bombs for Doan Gabriel. That's the way our offense should have been under Josh Heupel, but his playbook only consisted of three to four plays. But Gus Malzahn is definitely going to bring a more high-tempo offense to our team, but he's going to take a whole lot of time more off the clock to allow our defense to rest, which has been the biggest problem with our defense. We were 123rd in yards allowed last season but that was because our defense was on the field the whole entire game. So along with rest and a brand new defensive coordinator, I believe that our defense is going to be a whole lot better and that Gus is just going to make this team a whole lot better, don't you think so? Oh, I definitely agree. I'm very excited to see this era take off. And just thinking about the team that he's brought into UCF this season, there's so many players that have already played underneath him as a head coach. So with that relationship and that past, like coming into this team, it's going to help the offense, it's going to help the defense. You're going to see relationships that have already formed and it's going to be an easier execution when it comes to these new players coming in. I think it's going to be a nice kind of like, like I said, breath of fresh air. The sideline's going to be different. I feel that this is the biggest hyped up game for UCF since back in 2007 when they played Texas in their home opener. We usually play FIU, FAU, these smaller kind of programs, and now we're playing Boise State in a big primetime game, so I'm excited to see how it's going to turn out. So how do you think Dylan Gabriel's actually going to fare? Um, our star quarterback, preseason Heisman candidate. He needs 12 touchdowns to break the total UCF touchdown record, um, passing, I think, Mackenzie Miller, either Dante Culpepper. But how do you think that he's going to fare in a big game since he really hasn't shown up in big games these past two seasons. Very true. I think so last year him averaging 3,500 yards, 32 touchdowns and only four interceptions. Um, he has not played in one of these big time games and truly executed. He's never played in a conference championship. So I'm very excited to see how he will do this season. I think the tale of it all is going to be when they play Cincinnati. I think they need to get over that hump and I think that he needs to execute properly. Maybe more run game. We'll probably see that with him and Coach Malzahn that he's going to allow him to use his legs more um, and not just with the deep throws. So I'm excited to see that coming in and I think that if they do obviously end up playing Cincinnati in the conference championship, that's just more eyes on him for the Heisman. He also has the Louisville game this year, the Boise State game, Cincinnati again. So I'm very excited to see how he will execute, and I think that we're going to see 
greater stats for him this year. Yeah, I will say we do have a really tough schedule this year, Taylor, but we have a game tonight against Boise State, and it's no slouch. They have, they have been Mountain West Conference powerhouses for the past decade and a half, and they have a very good squad coming back, and I just want to see how Dylan Gabriel is going to fare, especially in this big-time game. First full-pack bounce house in almost two years. It's going to be a very big stage for Dylan, and I hope that Gus, Dylan, and a lot of these new transfers that are going to be coming in as well, the whole supporting cast around Dylan is going to be able to perform. Yeah, and the one that I think that I'm most looking forward to seeing, I think there's around 14 transfers that have come in through the transfer portal now. Um, Nate Craig Myers, I think him playing with Dylan and Jalen Robinson, these new wide receivers, he's going to have an amazing season. He averaged 18 yards per catch, um, four touchdowns when he was under Coach Malzahn while at Auburn. So I think already having a past with those two, um, I think Coach Malzahn's probably given Dylan a bunch of tips about how he is as a receiver. So I know that you have a very good transfer coming in too. So who are you excited to see? A very big transfer at that. A very large man in himself. And big cat Bryant. He played defensive end for Auburn for four years. He's a grad transfer coming to UCF. Um, it was actually even said in interviews, especially with the Orlando Sentinel, that he, is, he initially didn't want to come to UCF, but after talking with Travis Williams and after talking with Gus Malzahn, he said that he wanted to come here, and that's a very big upgrade to our defensive line. I think he had 55 total tackles and 10 sacks at Auburn. He was just a dominant force on that front, on that front defensive line, and I'm very excited to see what he's going to bring to the table tonight. No, me too. I think our defense is something that I want to see definitely improve this year. Um, so I think bringing him in as a veteran is going to help out a lot with this Boise State offense with Bachmeyer leading the way and Avalos leading the way as head coach for the first time this season. Um, it's kind of like a mutual pairing. We have new head coaches. We kind of have veteran quarterbacks, but I think it's going to be not as close as a game as people are leading it up to be, but I think offensively it's going to be a pretty good battle. Um, and I think Big Cat Bryant is definitely going to stop some of those big plays from Boise State. No, you're absolutely correct. I think Big Cat Bryant's going to bring a lot of pressure, especially to Hank Bachmeyer. He is UCF's returning um, junior starting quarterback, I believe. But it's going to be especially a huge challenge for Andy Avalos having to travel all the way to Central Florida, going to the packed bounce house. We know how loud the bounce house can get and how the bounce house can be rocking. So Boise State actually has a lot on their plate tonight. They have almost a bigger test than we do, but it's a huge test for both teams. I do believe that George Ohlone is going to be the key factor for Boise State if they want to come out with a W in this game. He is their returning senior running back. He was out of all of 2020 with a, I think it was a hamstring injury or like a lingering hamstring injury. But he had 1,000 yards in 2019. He has been their workhorse offensively, and he is going to be the key to victory for Boise State if they want any chance tonight. Yeah, and I know that you just talked about the run game. I think a transfer coming in for UCF that might be able to stop that is Ricky Barber from Western Kentucky. He is a new transfer coming in, and I think he might be able to just stop that Boise State run game. And I think with their young cornerbacks, I don't think they're going to be able to stop a Jalen Robinson in this type of wide receiver route that he likes to run, especially if Dylan tries to throw the deep ball. I just don't think that that young of a defense is going to compare with our offense. No, you're absolutely correct, Taylor, but we're not going to go ahead. I know we're kind of hinting at our predictions now, but our <laughs> predictions are actually going to come later in the show. But I do believe that it's going to be a huge challenge for both teams. It's a big measuring stick to see where this season's going to go, especially for UCF and for Boise State. Whoever wins this game, they have the highest upside in the world to keep the momentum rolling throughout the season. I'm just very excited to see it. But in order for UCF to win tonight, what are your two factors that are going to be key in order for a UCF victory tonight? I think the first thing is the offensive line led by veterans Schneider and Lee need to hold up to let Dylan run, the running backs run, and let these big plays be take place on the field. And I also think that if UCF gets down, they've been known in the past to get in a funk and it's super hard for them to get back. So I think the sideline needs to stay calm and push forward. And if they do get down, who cares? Score zero to zero, keep going. What about you? Um, I do believe that Jalen Robinson's actually our key factor tonight. He's our biggest playmaker on offense. Get him the ball in open space, jet sweeps, drag routes, get him in open space. He's our best athlete. And I think he's a better athlete than anyone on that Boise State team. Also, we need to force turnovers. Boise State was 10th in the Mountain West Conference last year in turnover differential at negative four and 107th in the whole entire college football landscape. 
And that's what UCF has done the past two years. They gave up a lot of yards, but they forced turnovers. So as long as we win the turnover margin tonight, we should be good. Yes, but, and we'll see those predictions coming up soon. We'll go over a few games, so stay tuned, and we'll let you know what our final score will be for this game. Oh, f it's <laughs> coming back. We're going to need to No way. <laughs> uh, welcome to the HTF uh, Hot Wings Challenge. Mm -hmm. What do you guys actually do hot sauce like regularly? No. It's like the least black thing I do. Oh, mm, wow, okay. I say Johnny goes first on this one. <laughs> okay, great. Now the Buccaneers are going to play the Washington football team. That can't happen. It will happen. I'm terrified. No, I really hate it. <laughs> no. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. You're wrong. If it wasn't for Kanye jumping up on stage and doing that, I'm going to let you finish, but no one will know those it <laughs> Nitros. Mm -hmm. Don't try. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, why is nitro thick? I don't know how many squats I need to do to get up like something like that, but I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh my God! Fake squat. Obvious reasons. Um, Babe Ruth. You want to go currently? <laughs> I feel like that's just like a good thing. Change. He jumped off the wall to catch the home run. <laughs> Made it through all the way to the end. Oh, Thank you for joining bad. us. I'm never doing this again. It was rough. Welcome back to nighttime, everybody. We're ready for our college football pick segment, and also um, we're just going to talk about a few of the games that we have going on this week. But I want to introduce a very special guest to the show. We have Kelly Campbell. Um, congratulations on being the first nighttime um, <laughs> guest, Kelly. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, yeah, we have a huge slate of games this weekend, a big week one. Um, actually, I want to throw it to you first, Kelly. Which game are you looking forward to most this weekend? Oh, well, you already know me. I'm a big Penn State fan, so Penn State, Wisconsin, 12 o'clock on Saturday. I couldn't be more excited. But also, we have a lot of top 25 matchups this week one that I'm looking forward to as well. What about you guys? I'm definitely looking forward to Miami, Alabama. I think it's going to be a close game. I think Alabama is obviously going to win and take the lead late in the game like they always do. But I think with Derek King and Bryce Young, these quarterbacks kind of don't know that much about them coming in. So I'm excited to see with these rebuilding years for these teams, how it will face off against each other in this big primetime game. What about you, Kyle? Well, I do want to throw it back to Miami, Alabama real quick because we do know a lot about Derek King. And that's the biggest thing for me in this game is that we just, there's so many question marks around him as a quarterback, especially in these big time games, neutral site games. It's just going to be hard to, it's, it's just hard for me to wrap my head around Derek King performing well, especially against Alabama. And I think that's going to be the biggest difference in this football game. But my biggest game that I'm looking forward to this weekend, a top five matchup, powerhouses, one in the SEC, one in the ACC, Clemson versus Georgia. I think this is the game actually where we see a little bit more of the unknowns, especially with JT Daniels and DJ Ugalele. Both teams are replacing a lot, it's, well, I mean, especially at the quarterback position. JT Daniels, he played a few games last season, but there's still a whole lot of unknowns. And DJ Ugalele has huge shoes, huge shoes to fill um, from Trevor Lawrence leaving going to the NFL. Both are highly touted, both have a lot of potential, but there's still a lot of question marks and I'm looking forward to seeing what they're gonna bring on Saturday night. Do you think so, Kelly, or not? Honestly, I would say the uh, Georgia Clemson game is definitely the one that I think is going to be more up in the air. For me personally, Alabama Miami is going to be an absolute blowout waste of a rented stadium. Should have been a home game. I, I don't know why it's even getting prime television time. I mean, I went to a Miami game last year and I saw them struggle against Central Michigan. That yeah. should be a story in itself. But as far as Georgia and Clemson goes, I mean, like you said, it's the quarterbacks. They're still pretty new to the scene. They're still pretty new to the environment, especially being different from last year with COVID. So I'm very excited to see these uh, younger quarterbacks get out there and just give me a good game the first week of college football, you know? Agreed. I think Ugulele's run game is what's going to be the biggest difference between these two quarterbacks with Georgia and Clemson. I think that it's going to come down to the last couple of plays, and I think that his run game will allow Dabo to make plays that will further Clemson's scoring. And I 
like I said, I think it's going to be very close, but that might be just the little bit of key factor that Clemson will need to push them. And we saw a little bit of that in the bowl game this previous season. He was pretty good at it. So I'll, I'm interested to see, and it's really a game that's going to be super entertaining. What about the returners for Georgia, guys? I mean, JT Daniels do have some games underneath his belt, but what about senior running back Samir White? He had 1,000 yards rushing last year. He's going to be the, probably the workhorse this game especially since George Pickens is still out with an ACL injury. We don't know when he's going to come back. But I think Zamir White is going to be carrying the load offensively, especially with still a mostly returning offensive line that had the top offensive line unit in the SEC last year. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's the key factor you just mentioned with the offensive line because we don't have that wide receiver that you just mentioned for Georgia. We just pretty much have White to rely on for that offense as a number one and I think that if he gets too tired and they overuse him too much that might just let Clemson um, push through. What do you think Kelly? I think that's Georgia's problem exactly. I think they put too much of the workload on one player or just a couple players. Every single year they get so many four and five star recruits that they're coming, they're getting there and Kirby Smart isn't developing them in the way that sh they should be developed. Georgia is always going to be one of the top dogs in the SEC I didn't even mean to make the pun, but um, I, I just, they're never going to be able to, I think, get to that next level, get over the hump. Like they have to start uh, really letting these guys become their own and just coaching them up or else it's going to be the same story as it is every year. They're going to get super close and, and they're just not going to hit the mark. Well, what about, I, I still have one more game that I want to talk about before we get to our primetime pick segment. I do want to talk about LSU-UCLA. The game is kind of off the radar this week, especially since UCLA is kind of not favored. I think, they're, I think, they're, I think LSU's favored by 10 points at least. It's LSU, three now. Co LSU comes in with a lot of question marks. They had a down season last season, and they're not even starting. Um, they're not even starting. They're starting quarterback Miles Brennan, who's out with an um, arm injury. I think Max Johnson will actually be taking the reps at quarterback on Saturday for the Tigers. But UCLA looked very, very strong last week. I mean, I know it's a Hawaii team, but that is probably the most efficient that I've ever seen a UCLA team. So you guys actually think that UCLA can compete? Um, no, and I get what you're saying, but I just think that LSU is the more talented team. And when it comes down in cases like this, the more talented team always comes out on top. Yes, UCLA did perform great against Hawaii, but Hawaii. So they're facing off against LSU and Coach O, and I just think LSU is going to take the win on this one. What do you think, Kelly? I agree with you 100%. I think I don't even know why it's being talked about. UCLA looks good against Hawaii, but a couple high school football teams around here would probably look good against Hawaii if we're being honest. So I'm excited to, I'm excited for college football in general, and I think we have a top 10 ranked LSU or top 25, excuse me. And we're just not, it's not going to be competitive. And if it is competitive, it will be probably because of that quarterback injury you were mentioning, uh, Kyle. But when you have like a veteran coach like Coach O and he's been recruiting just as he has been, um, I don't see them struggling against it. a UCLA team that hasn't been dominant in the last 10 plus years, probably. Yeah, I agree. So now it is time for our new segment, our primetime picks. So every week we're going to pick a couple games, give our score predictions, and at the end of the season, we're going to see who might come out on top. It's probably going to be me, not Kyle. Cool. And we're also going to see which guest has the best picks. So who knows? Kelly's the first one. She might have just the beginner's luck. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and start off with LSU and UCLA that we were just talking about. I'm going to say LSU is going to win 49-38. I think that it's going to be a very close game. I, I, it's going to be a lot closer than what the experts think. UCLA already has a game underneath the belt this season. LSU doesn't. But, I mean, I still think LSU is still going to prevail at the end of the day, especially with Max, I mean, even with Max Johnson starting at quarterback. But I'm going to go ahead and say 35-31 to 31 LSU. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a very, very close game. I'm going 38-24 Tigers. I think it'll be competitive maybe for the first bit there while LSU kind of gets comfortable, gets back into the swing of playing a game again. But again, I think LSU's going to get it together, get in the rhythm, and come out on top. All right, moving on to Alabama and Miami. I think that it's going to be a close game for a majority of it, but I think Alabama's 
going to go ahead and go up a couple touchdowns at the end, um, and I just think it's because they're going to play old school Alabama football with smart defense and strong offense and just see what happens. I think they are going to come out on top 38-24. And that is where you're wrong. I'm not picking Miami, though. Y'all thought for a second. <laughs> but I'm actually still going to pick Alabama, but it's not going to be particularly close. I'm going to go ahead and predict the score to be 45-10. to 10. It's not even going to be close. De'Aaron King is going to fold in the moment like he always has. I agree. I think Alabama is going to blow them out of the water. It's not going to be close. I think Nick Saban, after – I think Nick Saban is going to be Nick Saban. He's going to come out there and show him I'm Nick Saban. Like – and score a ton of points. I think it's going to be, uh, honestly, I think Bama might break 50 against this Miami team. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go 48-14. All right, moving into a game that we're all looking forward to with Georgia and Clemson. Kyle, you pretty much took this game for me for my top pick of the week, so it's fine because I know that our picks are different. I'm going Clemson 28-24, and that's just what's going to happen. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry to say that Georgia's actually going to take the dub. It's going to be a, it's a, it's a neutral site game. It's not at Clemson. It's not at Georgia. So it's even for both teams. And I just think the experience of Georgia is going to take this one. There's so many questions at Clemson with all the graduate transfers and with all the graduates and all the players going to the NFL. I actually think Georgia's going to take this week one, uh, 28 to 21. Uh, Georgia hasn't had a taste of a big win in, in a little while, but I don't think that's going to stop Dabo. Dabo's not going to give it to him now, not in the first week. Uh, Clemson doesn't Clemson until later in the season. But I'm going to take Clemson as well, agree with Taylor, and I'm going to go 38-21. Uh, all right, Gus Bus taken off in just a few hours. I'm going UCF 38-20 versus Boise State. Go Knights, baby. Yeah, go Knights. 42-21, to Knights win. Kelly, quickly. Kyle, you took my final score. I was going to say the same exact thing as you, but I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to give Boise 17 instead of 21. But go Knights. I choose the Knights. Go Knights. Thank you guys for tuning in, and make sure to stay tuned. We're going to show our interview with Jason Beatty coming right up. Hello everyone, welcome back to Nighttime. I have a very special guest in Jason Beatty, um, alongside of course my co-host Taylor Anderson. Jason, how, how are we doing today, man? I'm good. We're at this point hours away from kickoff and I'm just really excited for this UCF football season to start and big game against Boise State up first. Especially. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and congratulate you on your new job with the Orlando Sentinel and especially as a beat reporter for UCF football. Like, How exciting is that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, pretty remarkable. I wasn't expecting it. Um, you know, I graduated from UCF spring 2020. I was previously working for 24-7 Sports. Uh, I was the publisher of Knights247.com. And I, over the summer, had an opportunity to head over to the Orlando Sentinel. I previously did a couple of internships with them, and uh, it's been a great experience so far. I've been on the job for about two weeks with them. Uh, so I'm just excited for the seasons to start. And it's, it's really cool being able to cover UCF again for the Sentinel. So we have a lot of aspiring sports journalists here at Hitting the Field, and you were here at UCF not that long ago going through everything. So what type of advice do you have for any of us behind the screen right now looking at you at the Sentinel um, and any words of encouragement on how to keep pushing forward? Yeah, I think the biggest thing to remember is, you know, you, you got to be able to go out and do those internships and, and put yourself in an uncomfortable position because that's the only way you're going to learn. If you just stay in that comfortable position and, and you're happy with that, you know, that, that's great, but you're never going to learn. You're never going to get better. Um, you know, even if I'm at the Sentinel now, that doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm still learning every single day. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm put in stressful situations and uncomfortable spots, but that's how I grow as a journalist. And, and you know, you want to be able to look for those internships and, and do as much as you can. You also have to remember mental health is really important and you don't want to spread yourself too thin, right? But, uh, you know, when you're in college, you know, I think people focus on, uh, you know, just class and stuff. I think it's, there's so much more. I mean, everything I learned uh, writing for NSM today was great, but really I learned out in the field doing in two, in two internships with the Orlando Sentinel, uh, getting that real world experience. I mean, the professors at UCF, uh, you know, they're, they're really great and, and they have, you know, really good things to teach you guys, but, um, you know, real world experience, nothing else like that for sure. So, you know, I think just being able to learn and understanding that, um, even though we're young, we're also real journalists um, and, and, you know, being able to go out and look for those real world experiences are key. And you're 
pretty much the first person to ever cover this new offense for UCF with Gus coming in, running as head coach and leading the offense into some new ways of running things. So what are you kind of looking forward to seeing from this offense with the game? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how Gus Malzahn is able to use Dylan Gabriel. Uh, you know, the, these past few seasons with Josh Heupel, I think that was one of the biggest criticisms. Uh, you know, his offense was up-tempo and fast, and Malzahn's offense still will continue to be that way. But, you know, Josh Heupel's formula for an offense was, you know, three or four plays, 75 yards, they're off the field in 35 seconds. You know, that's, that's not really a, a sustained, sustainable way to play football for your defense. They're going to be gassed every drive. So I'm excited to see how Malzahn uses more of the field. We've talked about uh, this preseason, there's been a lot of talk about using the middle of the field and, and, and going back to having screen passes with your running backs. And I think a lot of UCF fans are excited to see a little bit more of a complex, complicated offense with, um, you know, not, not just the same three or four plays that Hypo was running. But one thing that Gus Malzahn does that Josh Hypo really doesn't do is establish a run game. And that does, that's basically what you're saying by use the whole entire field. We're trying to waste time off the clock by also going up tempo, not score as fast as possible like Josh Hypo used to do. Yeah, we put up 40 points a game, but our defense on the field three quarters of the game. And that's just, it's not the way that you win football games, especially with how tired they were. Do you also think that Gus is going to be trying to use Dylan in the run game too, like he did with Cam Newton and Bo Nix? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think uh, we've seen Dylan develop as a runner. I, mean, I remember freshman year, there were obvious times when he had open field to run and he was a little hesitant. Now, maybe that was because he had just seen his best friend, Mackenzie Milton, the season before. You know, we all know about his leg injury. There was maybe some mental, uh, you know, mental hesit hesitancy going on there. And we saw him in 2019 and last season, he continued to get more comfortable uh, you know, getting out of the pocket, extending the plays, creating plays on his own. You know, I don't think we've seen uh, as much as we can from him in the run game. So, you know, uh, I'll be curious to see. I don't think he's as big as Cam Newton was. I think Cam was a little bit taller, a little bit bigger maybe. Um, but I'm excited to see how they use him. I think it'll be really intriguing. I think um, absolutely it's probably going to be part of the game, game plan for sure. So you do think that he does fit into our, like this new offense we're going to be running pretty well? I think so. I mean, I, I really believe it. Um, you know, I, I was telling Mike Bianchi of the Orlando Sentinel the other day, I think outside of when Malzahn was an offensive coordinator with Cam Newton, uh, you know, <laughs> Dylan Gabriel is probably the best quarterback Malzahn's had a head coach. Yep. Uh, and that's nothing against Bo Nix and the other Auburn quarterbacks. But you just look at the, you know, the passing records that Dylan Gabriel set. Uh, he's has the most 400 yard passing games as a UCF quarterback. Uh, in, in program history, and he's up there with Dante Culpepper and Blake Bortles and Mackenzie Milton and the rest of the, you know, top 10 quarterbacks in program history. So, um, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see how he uses them for sure. So switching over to the other side of the ball, how do you feel about Travis Williams as our defensive coordinator and how much improved is our defense, do you think, from the past couple of seasons? Yeah, I'll start with that first, that first question about, about Coach T. Will as he's known in the offense, in the locker room. Uh, T. Will, Travis Williams, he's energetic. I mean, Gus, Gus has a way of talking, and, you know, he's, he's not his first rodeo, but this is the first time Travis Williams is a defensive coordinator on his own like this. Uh, and he, he brings energy to the room. He's got uh, just a really positive attitude when we talk with him, and uh, he, he's really relatable to the players. That's the, one of the biggest things I hear. You know, he, he acts like a player himself. Obviously, he's mature enough to be a defensive coordinator to a D1 program, but – um, he's really relatable, and, and, you know, I'm excited to see what the defense looks like. Um, you know, they, they, they brought in some transfers, Big Cat Bryant from Auburn, uh, Ricky Barber from Western Kentucky. He was an all-conference player, really good freshman uh, last year for Western Kentucky. Um, you know, they, they have some questions in the secondary, but you mentioned improving on defense. Honestly, it can't get much worse. I mean, they ranked 123rd in the country last season, giving up, I mean, I swear to God, 490 yards, almost 500 yards a game. Uh, they average, I think they were giving up 30, almost 30 points a game. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to get much worse than that. So I think with the transfer additions, you know, new defensive coordinator in there, new position coaches on there, uh, you know, under obviously Gus Malzahn has talked about it, you know, to win a championship, you got to have championship defense. And I feel like under Josh Heifel, you know, maybe he really wasn't acting as a head coach. There was offense and defense. Under Gus, you have a whole team. Uh, and with Travis Williams in there, uh, being relatable to the players, it seems as though the defense should be better. I mean, you can't get much worse than 123. One question I did want to ask, you did mention the transfer portal. We had, I think, 12 players come from the transfer portal that Gus Malzahn did bring in. Who's going to be the most impactful transfer, do you think, from day one? 
Yeah, and actually that number is, uh, you know, I think it's up to 14 now. They recently added Joey Gatewood from Kentucky and a, a redshirt running back, Woody Barrett from, uh, I don't remember the school he came from, but I know he previously played for Gus at Auburn as well. Of the 14, there's five or six of them that previously played at Auburn. So and I think that says a lot about Malzahn uh, and his ability as a, as a likable coach, ability to coach, and uh, players want to play for him, obviously. Um, you know, in terms of impact, I, I got to go with Big Cat Brian, who I mentioned. You know, he's, he's an all-SEC caliber player. Uh, he dealt with injury last season. I, I've talked with him a couple times this preseason, uh, and, and he's just saying how he wants to prove everyone wrong. Uh, he admitted at first, no way in heck he was going to come to UCF, but after he evaluated his options and talked with Travis Williams and Gus Malzahn, you know, he's an instant upgrade uh, for the defensive line at, at that defensive end spot. Um, you know, if, if he's able to do what he, we've seen him do at Auburn in the past, I mean, he, he's going to be really dangerous out there for opposing quarterbacks for sure. So I know that we have like a really strong fan base here at UCF. We have really passionate alumni and current students. Do you think that the expectations might be a little too high moving into this new season of football for this team? Yeah, you know, we, I've seen so many fans put polls on Twitter and asking like, you know, what, what would be a failure? Um, you know, we, we saw what happened with Josh Heupel 12 and one. And then it was like a four lot. It was, you know, two losses and then four losses last year, six and four, there was, you know, frustration. Obviously I think, you know, no matter what, I understand Gus Malzahn's an SEC experienced coach. He's played in the biggest stage at Auburn. He's coached some of the best athletes in the country and all of that. Uh, and Dylan Gabriel's entering his junior seasons, the money year, potentially if he, if all things go well, he can enter the draft early if he wants to. And there's a lot of talent around him. Uh, but at the same time, First year head coach at UCF, Gus Malzahn, brand new staff. There's bound to be hiccups. It happens. You know, it's football. You look at the 2017 season and what UCF had to do to go undefeated. You know, there were some key moments in there where if the ball goes the other way, they're not going to go undefeated. So when you add just the randomness of football, uh, hiccups with the coaching staff, I think, you know, if, if they're not able to go on the road and beat Cincinnati and, uh, you know, maybe struggle late in the season at SMU, Obviously, I mean, shoot, tonight's game against Boise State, that's a tough game. That's, that's a tough season opener. We haven't seen that from UCF, really. Usually they play against FAMU or, uh, you know, Bethune-Cookman in season opener. Uh, to open against Boise State, that's a really big test and a measuring stick uh, for, to see the success of this program. So, you know, if, if they go 10-2, and two, I still think that's considered success. Well, considering everything that is involved, what do you believe the ceiling is for the UCF football team this year? Yeah, I think, you know, they, they, they should be able to compete with Cincinnati. I mean, that realistically, that could be the only loss on the record. Uh, and with no more divisions, you could see that rematch in the conference championship in December. Um, you know, I think traveling to Cincinnati, that's a tough place to win. Luke Fickle is obviously an experienced coach. They have some All-American defenders uh, in the secondary and on that, on that Cincinnati squad, Desmond Ritter, a really good quarterback who's gotten a lot of preseason hype. They played in the Peach Bowl last year, although they didn't beat Georgia. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, if the team, you know, you look at the 2017 season, at a certain point, they got to like 7-0 and or 8-0. It was like, okay, they're not going to lose the rest of this way. There's just a feeling you can get. So, you know, these first four, five, six games are really important. They set the tone for the rest of the season. You know, if things are able to click and they're able to learn Gus Malzahn's uh, offense with him calling the plays, and like I mentioned, the defense should be improved, there's a real opportunity for this team to do something special. Uh, but mm -hmm. it takes a lot for sure. Yeah, even though we do have a very tough schedule this year, there have been talks that we could possibly be moving up conferences, especially with those um, big-time schools, Cincinnati, Houston, Memphis. They're, they're all in talks to go to the Big 12 here in the next four years, especially with Oklahoma and Texas going over the SEC. How good do you think it'll actually be for us to go to the Big 12 and go against teams like Iowa State and Kansas and Kansas State every single season? How do you think that we would fare, I think, in the, those four years? I know it's a long way down the road, though. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I think you have to evaluate, uh, you know, even if you want to join it, uh, join the conference. I mean, you talk about uh, the, rem the remaining teams in the Big 12 and, and what that's going to look like once OU and Texas actually leave. You know, uh, there have been reports that, you know, the AAC was trying to get teams to join their conference and, and make a new power conference. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if those eight teams remain in the Big 12 uh, and UCF has an invite to add, you know, a BYU, a Boise State, a Houston, or a Memphis, or whoever it may be that ultimately gets the invite, you got to take that money and run. Uh, you know, that's that's five to ten million more dollars a year uh, in, in TV revenue, and who knows how else those 
big TV deals can be. When you're able to recruit in the state of Florida, we've already seen Gus Malzahn. They have 12 kids committed, nine are from the state of Florida. Uh, it's, it's a really talented class. So, you know, I've heard from Gus and, and met coaching staff members, uh, you know, say all the time, they talk with kids to get top talent on, on campus. And then they go, wait, we're not power five conference. That's, that's a big thing for recruiting. Like, I don't think people understand that G5 tag hurts UCF's recruiting. So, um, you know, when you get the right players in there and you're able to add transfers and with a transfer portal, immediate eligibility now being a thing uh, with, with more money and, and more recruiting at a higher level, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be as much of a struggle. You know, I don't think they're going to get in there and compete for a conference championship right away if that happens and they get into the Big 12 or whatever that next Power 5 conference is going to look like. Um, but I do think um, – you know, the American, it can be considered a better conference than the Pac-12 really these past couple seasons. So it really isn't that much of a talent gap. Obviously, the best teams in the SEC are a little different. The Alabamas and then obviously Clemson as well in the ACC. So, um, you know, there's a gap, but I don't think it's as big as people may think it may be. If the Big 12 says, hey, we're, we're fine with where we're at and there's no teams need to be added and, and they want to see how that goes uh, and, and you're able to get this expanded playoff in, you know, maybe 2025, the earliest 26 maybe, um, as opposed to like, I think 32 or something like that in the late twenties or the early thirties is when the TV contracts are up with the playoff, uh, committee and stuff. Um, but you know, if you aren't able to get into a power five, you know, realistically with the, you know, six teams, six, the six highest ranked conference champions, I think that was the model that they were going with, you know, UCF can compete for a conference championship and, uh, you know, get their spot every season in the, in the expanded playoffs. So, you know, maybe even look at that and say, hey, maybe we don't need to go to Power 5 uh, right away. If, if the stability of the Big 12 is in question, maybe you just stick with out and uh, you get in the playoff every year. Yeah, because the Americans are still high-flying. Like, they're, they're actually really good in other sports, too, not just football. Like, football is actually kind of, like, at the down end of where they're at. They're really good at softball, really good at baseball. They're also very good at volleyball as well. So, I mean, the Americans no slouch. It's just that they don't have the money that a lot of these big-time, big, t- big, time, big uh, Power 5 conferences have. So, I – fully agree with you on that point yeah that that's the biggest challenge right I mean you mentioned other sports I think uh you know you look at what Houston was able to do make a final four this past March Madness and we know about Cincinnati's uh basketball program and Penny Hardaway is recruiting some incredible talent at his basketball program we get he's getting I mean top five class top number one class I think right now actually uh with recent commitment um you know so the American you know I think people think about football there's a lot that goes into conference realignment and conference expansion it's academics it's and maybe maybe not the main thing but academics are one thing uh you know the fact that UCF plays in Orlando where the TV market I think is the largest in the country without a NFL team inside of it that's that's a huge factor uh you know BYU can't say that right uh but you know you look at UCF's men and you know men's and women's soccer Terry Mahajra said they want to compete every year for national championships and uh you know you look at Renaya Jones and what she's doing trying to compete for the Olympics and the volleyball has set, has had success in softball and baseball. Uh, it's, it's more than just a football decision with this conference realignment. Everything I've mentioned is it goes into that for sure. All right, real quick, real quick before we end up two keys to victory for UCF uh, tonight. Yeah, I think the biggest one, don't turn the ball over. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen how Dylan Gabriel, uh, you know, I think he's a pretty accurate passer, but you gotta be able to, you know, uh, con- control the football and, and, you know, not, if you turn the ball over, bunch of times that leads to Boise State points most likely um and then and then really you know we talk about so much about this defense I think containing Hank Bachmeyer Boise State they have a pretty uh you know veteran quarterback coming back this season he's got some good weapons around him you don't want to get him even though he's a pocket passer you don't want him out of the pocket and uh creating plays like Dylan Gabriel would hopefully do uh against Boise State so I would say you know control the football you know don't turn it over and uh, play good defense. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to. Are you allowed to give a prediction for score? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I can. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to go with uh, UCF 37, Boise State 31. Okay. Uh, I, th- I think it's a little closer. Right. I think it, I think it's going to be high scoring. I think, you know, we've heard a little bit about Boise State's defense. They have some experience returning. I think they have like three or four six-year seniors coming back. Um so they have an experienced group, but at the same time, it's like, you know, when UCF played Cincinnati last season, that game was in the thirties as well. So it, it's hard to keep UCF to less than 30 points. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, knowing Boise state and what they, what they can do on the football field, I think it's going to be high scoring. I think it's going to be close and really exciting for everyone watching at home. 
Awesome. Yeah, so we're so excited to watch the game tonight versus Boise State. Jason, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. We so appreciate it, and we appreciate your advice as well. And we wish you good luck with reporting for the rest of the season. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate